Want to have your own business but don't want to start from scratch? Franchising might be the answer you're looking for. Welcome to the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. The show that brings you thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development. Whether you're a buyer, seller, franchisee, franchisor, or a consultant, find everything you need to know about franchising right here. Own a business without the pain and financial losses that come with creating it. Find the time, freedom, and financial independence you can have through entrepreneurship. Learn how franchising can help you get there. Listen up and get ready for another episode of The Level Up with Nick Lopez Show. Welcome to The Level Up Show with Nick Lopez, where we have the absolute pleasure of learning from thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development. Today's guest, most certainly goes without exception. He turned chaos in 2008 into opportunity by scaling a national flooring company to over 150 locations and growing. He is the founder and CEO of Footprints Floors International, Brian Park. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Nick, for having me on here. Not quite international. Someday, maybe. Yeah, Footprints Floors. uh, Yeah, LLC, I think, is our official name, but we'll take it. (laughs) Oh, right on. Yeah, uh, that's a great clarification there. Um, But nonetheless, a a tremendous company and and one that I admire. Uh, And you're right here in in our backyard in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Most certainly seen your growth over the years and I've heard from a lot of folks in franchising, mutual connections, really, uh, of just the special things that you're doing. And I'm often pointed to network and catch up with you. So it's really an honor that um, you're on the show. I I know that folks will most certainly level up from the conversation and specifically your experience. And, And so without further ado, let's jump in. Let's get started. Um, Brian Park, founder, CEO of Foot, Footprints Floors. Um, Brian, how did franchising find you? I, I love that question because I, I I do think it's very much a, a find you, at least in my experience in my world. I'm not I'm sure there's some franchisors that that was their plan and they pushed into it and made it happen, but certainly found found me or found us. We uh, I was in the Air Force, got out of the military, looking for a job, started installing floors, install sand and finished hardwood floors for a living uh, for a few years, really just to feed my young family. I was married and starting to have kids and had a mortgage and all kinds of that. So started installing floors uh, from there, worked for a company for a few years, 2008 recession hits, got started footprints um, from there because I got let go from that business. They stopped paying their employees. So I had to start my own thing. So footprints floor started in uh, December of 08, the middle of the recession. I had two year old and an eight month pregnant wife and an 800 square foot house and just needed to figure it out. So, uh, and really for the next handful of years, grew the business in in Denver. I was doing the floors myself, uh, moved into Know, managing the business and bringing on additional people. And then really in 2013 was when we decided to move into franchising. Um, and it wasn't so much a decision to move into, it was much more of a pull. It, you know, it found, found us, just like you said. Uh, and it was really, I had split Denver up into, into halves and I approached one of my friend or my crews and said, Hey, I can't drive to the North side of town anymore. It's just too much. Uh, do you want to take the north side and I'll take the south side? You send me back a percentage of what you book and sell. And uh, and I'll provide like the marketing and the answering your phones and all that for you. And it was really 100. And so the alternative would have been to turn him into an employee and then go go that route. Didn't want to go that route because workers comp is ridiculously expensive in construction. I'm like, oh, it's going to be like $100,000 a year in workers comp to, to turn that guy into an employee. So we went this other route, got to the end of the year though. Great. It worked great. But our accountant said, this is kind of illegal. You can't have him be 1099. He needs to be an employee and you got to pay workers comp. 
or it kind of looks like you're running him as a franchisee. And I was like, I don't know what that even is. And so that I started researching what franchising was. Apparently it's not just McDonald's. Uh, and that was the beginning of our model. I hired some guy off the internet for 2,500 bucks to make our first FDD and agreement to put that in perspective, our current agreements like $300,000. So the $2,500 version was, we called it our, our Swiss cheese uh, FDD because it was just, it was a disaster. It was some boilerplate thing this guy had thrown together. In fact, I didn't proofread it well enough. There was actually spots in the FDD that still referenced the window washing company, <laughs> but he had, <laughs> and I didn't notice it. It was like done. And I'm like giving it to my first franchisees and they're like, hey, what's this window washing section? I'm like, oh, just skip that paragraph. Well, that was the beginning of, of our, luckily our first few franchisees were my buddies. And these were guys that we were just getting this document in, in place to kind of govern the relationship. But um, yeah, that was me getting pulled into, into franchising. Yeah, what, what an incredible story, right? Uh, serving it in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, you know, uh, thanks so much for your service, by the way. Yeah. Uh, my, my boys did a, a wrestling tournament down at the academy about a month ago. It was pretty neat. It's just such a, a special place. Um, the Air Force Academy down in Colorado Spring. Oh, yeah. No, I enjoyed being there. Learned a lot. Definitely helps with, with the running of a business, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that you, you mentioned there, Brian, was that, you know, you were laid off in the Great Recession, right? You, 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 um, you said it clearly, it's part of your story. It's probably just so normal for you. But, um, would you mind taking us back there? Uh, you know, 2008, 2009, Great Recession, you know, the auto industry, there's a lot of corporate greed scandals going on. Uh, the stocks are just plummeting and, and uh, real estate was, you know, it's a big bubble there. Um, there's most certainly a lot of narratives in that time frame, And uh, you, you ended up starting a, a business in, in that. Um, so, you know, I want to go back there. I'm curious, you know, when it comes to fear, how do you make decisions? Like, how, like, let's use this as an example, right? Back in 2008, 2009, you started a company, right? And that was your response was to start a company. Um, you know, it seems like a time full of fear. You know, how did you make the decision to start a business? You know, and you started one from scratch. Ma and Pa style, it, you know, wasn't franchising, franchising much different, right? You you have all the answers, the, the blueprint, the collaboration from the owners, uh, everything that you need to, to get into business, you're doing it from scratch. There's, there's a lot to unpack there, but the short answer is just my faith, glory to God. You know, that's, that's what carried us through those early days and was there fear? Oh my gosh, heck yeah. But the, the beauty of, of faith is God is sovereign and, and there's, you know, there's no reason to fear. And that's really where our name comes from. Footprints Floors is a poem called Footprints in the Sand. That's all about uh, uh, God carrying you even in the worst, worst trials. Um, that's, it is then that he actually is carrying you. Um, but yeah, it was, it was trials and, but we, we persevered. My wife is amazing. Um, so beyond my faith, it's relying on on my wife and our family. Those those early days, I was it was truly mom and pop out of my garage, and we were walking neighborhoods, putting flyers on doors in December and January in Colorado. My father in law <laughs> out there walking around in the dark, putting flyers on doors, trying to get something, drum up something, because yeah, the the world had shut down. Nobody was buying floors. Construction was especially hit. Nobody was moving. Uh, you know, everything was frozen up. And then, so the demand had dropped, but supply hadn't dropped yet. There was still a lot of flooring companies out there scraping for the, the little scraps that were on the table. Uh, and a lot of them ended up going out of business, but yeah, we, we launched right in the middle of that. Uh, and it was, yeah, by God's grace. I, I heard years later, somebody say that the Lord always pulls you into places he wants you to be. You don't have to push your way in and I've always looked back, you know, in the, in the lens of your life, looking back going, yeah, he really does create paths and, and pulls you in where, where he wants you to be. And that's, I think, really our story up to this day is the Lord just pulling us through. And so we really see this as his business and we're servants and uh, of, of his uh, stewardship is a, is a 
biblical word to be a steward of something. The Lord has put us in charge of his, his business. So um, as fear goes, yes, fear is there, uh, but there is no need for fear. How, how, am, how am I just getting into conversation with you, Brian? I, I can see why so many people are like, Nick, you need to meet Brian. <laughs> Uh, what a cool story. And, you know, I love, I love your immediate response there. It's faith, right? And it's, it's beyond yourself. And, um, you know, in those trials, uh, you know, that is when God is closest and it, to put it the way you did, you know, he's ultimately getting you through it. Um, and, you know, you had mentioned something there pretty nuancy, but, you know, you, you don't have to worry. You don't have to have concern because you have faith in knowing that you are being pulled in this case pulled into this path and uh it, it sounds like there's some high performance components there just meaning that it sounds like when you're walking into un the unknown it's important not to acknowledge or think about that unknown or at least put it front and center i feel like there's something there but ultimately, your secret weapon is your faith allows you to remove that fear. I mean, there's a lot there. We could talk for hours and hours about what, how my faith is intertwined into, into our business. But I, I really try not to make any decisions without prayer and without you know wise counsel of those that are around me. Uh, so, yeah, when we do enter into unknowns and decisions, whether it was back you know, 15 years ago or, or today, it's really staring at those unknowns and, and putting them through prayer and through through the lens of this this wise counsel and 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 really kind of trying to come to a place of where where should we where should we be what which direction should we go should we do it or not and you know praying that it is made clear to us um, and if you, you go through these exercises and you really uh, look you know seek God's will and not your own then fear is removed because if it's his his will then then there's there's no need for fear. So. Yeah, if he's going to provide for the birds in the sky, right? They don't wake up and say, hey, "Is the sun coming up? Where where am I going to get my seeds for the day?" You know, they're not they're not worried about those things. They're they're provided, and and clearly, if God provides for the birds, he's he's going to provide for you, uh, his, his child. So, uh, what what peace there? What what um, what authority though? Right? I mean, you're walking into your day with full authority of your dominion, which is your business that of which you're called the steward. Um, so neat and, and such a grounded way to lead and steward your organization. Um, you know, I, I bet your, your franchise owners are totally in love and confident with leadership and direction and, and knowing that you're grounded in the way that you make decisions and they're not hasty decision. And, and we're going to get into how you include your franchise owners and, and everything else. But I do want to move on here. You know, I, I could only imagine that, you know, growing your organization over the past decade or so from the franchise perspective uh, to over 150 locations, I would assume you've hit some plateaus, Brian. Uh, you know, what, what were some of those major plateaus that you can think about? And and ultimately, how did you navigate through them? We're actually in the middle of our, our first major franchising plateau. I mean, we had some plateaus in the early days before we started franchising, just growing the business in Denver. Uh, but from the day that we launched nationally back in, I don't know, June of 19, we just took off like a rocket ship. We went from one state to 40 and eight territories to like 170 in in three, two and a half, three years. Um, we have plateaued a little bit in this last year. And I, I think part of it might be the economy and part of it, I think is just a natural um, progression of, of business. And this is our, our current um, thought. We don't, we don't have all the answers. We're just trying to figure it out as we go here. I'm a floor guy that's pretending to know what he's, what he's doing here. Um, <laughs> yeah, our, our, our current plateau, I, you know, we, we grew so much. So we have 83 franchisees and like 60 something of them are all in their first or second year. Uh, so it's a lot of just figuring it out and trying to, and I think we've done a good job, but we're at this place and part of the plateau is we're just wanting everybody to mature and I use the word 
percolate for a while. We, everybody needs to kind of just simmer a bit and cook and get, you know, experience and become better at their jobs. And um, that's what we're seeing right now. So it's uh, in some ways a natural uh, plateau that we're uh, taking advantage of to really develop our current franchisees. And then if it's the Lord's will to launch again, then we will and, and skyrocket. If not, then we're content where we're at. Yeah, you're you're content where you're at, right? And really doubling down on the season that you're in, which is, you know, taking these first, second year franchise owners and and doubling down on what hey, what works in the business? And uh let, let's get you executing on what matters to drive some results and uh you know get you into you know year three, year four, year five as your business continues to mature. Um, you know, so you know, you're, you're, um, you know, helping these owners in their first one, two, three years uh, of business, what are the key milestones that you're looking for in those, in that early season? And uh, how are you getting them there? The first milestone is completing training. So we have like four weeks of training they go through and, and launch them in a good spot. And then from there, uh, we, we've invested heavily um, financially and bringing on staff and then heavily just in my own time in ongoing just development. We, we bring in, we have trainings like three a month. We bring in industry experts. We have all kinds of kind of that standard stuff, but we've been doing uh, what we call business reviews for the first six months. They do it monthly. And then from there on, we do a business review with them annually with me. Um, so I go through their P and L's from last year for an hour and just, pour into it and see what I see. Um, I'm, let's see, 50, 52 of 80 right now. I've got like 12 left to go. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of hours, but I love doing it. And I love uh, pouring into these guys and gals to really help them see, because they're new. A lot of them never even ran a bit business before. So it's teaching them the basics of P&Ls. And this is what you should be looking for. As far as key uh, KPIs go, or we're looking at, at estimate count. So that's overall like volume and opportunity. Um, we look at sales numbers and the, the internal term we use is called the power rating, which is essentially uh, revenue per estimate. So we're looking for $1,000 per estimate or plus is the metric that we use. Um, our average job size is probably smaller than yours. It's like 40, 200 bucks or something like that. And then uh, the last one is gross margin. Are you capturing uh, you know, the revenue after cost of goods sold. And if, if they hit those three metrics, then everything else takes care of itself. They're making good money. They're being efficient with their time and, and their love and life. If they're not hitting those metrics, then those are areas of growth and opportunity for us to pour into them. And have you tried this? Let's do this. Let's go through sales training again. Here's these videos that we've created. You know, let's, let's pair you up with our sales expert and make sure that you understand all of the, of what you need to be doing. So yeah, just there's, there's tons. There's a lot. Yeah. Mm, so it's revenue per customer, um, gross margin, and what what was the third one, Brian? Uh, estimate count and, and the it's it's uh, revenue per estimate, not necessarily. Well, yeah, I, depending on how you define customer, but yeah, if we're in a house, then how much are we turning into? If you go to ten estimates, did you book ten thousand dollars? That's the question. Whether it was one job that was ten grand, and you went one for ten, or if you went ten for ten and they're all thousand bucks. It's about the the revenue side of it that's a matter that matters to us. Mm -hmm. And and you can probably see, you know, what is the average ticket of just overall estimates, and then what is the average ticket of the actual sold? Yep, exactly. Yeah, I think that's an important differentiator there, right? You can dive into, uh, you know, just the the overall quality of the presentation, which you know I'm sure you're inferring that from the PL and and thus your comment about hey let's dive into some sales training and and uh, figure out how to grow the average ticket or or grow the average ticket of the ones that are closed hmm. what what are some themes that you notice as you're as you're doing that PL review and you're doing almost 80 of them nearly through all of them but what what are some themes a major theme which i love seeing <laughs> it gives it you know justifies all we're doing is there's been a tremendous amount of success. These guys are making really good money. You know, and well, most of them more than they've ever made in their lives, which I love seeing it. You know, that's the entire reason for doing this. I'd feel terrible if they weren't right. Um, but no, we've seen a lot of success. The model works. Uh, there's a lot of happiness and, and everybody's is loving what they do. There's definitely some outliers there for sure. And those are people we're pouring into more and more. 
Um, but overall, the major theme is tremendous success. Um, and then it's just fine tuning. It's like, hey, you know, are you following the sales model? How are you managing your crews? How is getting five star reviews going for you? And, and really kind of encouraging and pushing them into that. We're, we're ending each call by creating a, a to do list, like tangible list of things they can do starting tomorrow. Uh, go talk to this person, do this, sign up for that all things that are going to help fix whatever minor deficiencies they might have in their business and just continue to grow and get better and advance and drive and goal set and all things that business owners should be doing. Wow. And they're getting this opportunity with yourself. I could only imagine the percentage of, of franchise organizations that do that uh, individual P and L review and then business consulting uh, with every single franchise owner. That's, that's really impressive, Brian, and I uh, commend you for that. Uh, clearly a reflection of the way that you run your organization. Um, so, you know, why are, why are reviews so important? Why, why is that something that you're talking about uh, with your franchise partners? One, it's, it's not about me. It's about them. You know, we're here to serve them. What are, and, and if you, if you come to, if you come, if you make decisions with that being the center, central focus, what others, others first love, love thy neighbor, then what is the best way to use my time? And it's, it's helping them in this way. It's, it's pouring into them and hopefully helping them do better and better. I've noticed that a lot at goal setting is a natural tendency for me. Like that's just ingrained in me. I'm constantly thinking about the future and six and two years and five years and 10 years. Like that's just how my brain works. And then if I'm not goal setting, I'm not breathing. Um, but I think I'm weird. And I think that the vast majority of people are not natural goal setters. Uh, and so they, there's a tendency uh, for them to, to not think too much about it. And for them to just kind of go through the motions of the year, it's like, oh, he's got money in my bank account. Things must be going well. It's like, yes, maybe, but they could be going better if you did this and this and move towards this goal. And uh, and so that's, I think, a lot of uh, what I can do and, and help is I am a goal setter and I enjoy doing it. And so to sit and help them, and we don't want to set the goals for them. It's not my business, it's theirs. So it's really coming alongside them, helping them think through their own goals and set their own goals. And then how can we help them achieve what they're, they're trying, what they're trying to achieve? And it's, you know, some have lower goals, some have high goals and everything in between. And, you know, we don't have any uh, strong opinions about it. What, what do you guys, what do you want to do this year? Okay. Well, let's, how, how are we going to get there? Um, I might have my two cents, like that's a pretty low goal. I mean, you did this last year. You should exceed that. What do you think about this? And like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, and it's relationships. It's just staying in front of them and reminding them that, you know, your franchisor is a real person that cares about you. And I think that goes a long way. Hmm. Yeah. Do you ever find that in these conversations, right? It's clearly their business. It's their goals. Um, you might have some opinions here and there, of course, but um, do, do you ever find that when you're giving tips and tricks on how to improve the business and improve the P&L, that there's a little bit of hesitation or some resistance from your franchise partners? Or is everybody just totally like, you got it, thumbs up? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I, and and having done these business reviews for a couple of years and 60 of them under my belt this year, it, it, there's a definite theme that comes out that the more willing, I use that word willing on purpose, the more willing a franchisee is to push into the model, the more likely that they'll be very successful and make a lot of money. And it's each unwillingness in them, usually fear or time constraints or effort um, that leads them to fall short of some of these expectations from the model. Each one of those ends up resulting in just a little bit less success. So for like example, here, here's an easy one that I see constantly. We teach them and beat it into them through, through our sales training that, hey, spend an hour with your homeowner and we want you to do the estimates inside the home. Write it up right there with the homeowner. We have all of the technology. It's super easy. And then simply ask for the sale. We're not slimy used car salesmen doing these hard closes, but just say, hey, how does that sound? Is this something you'd like to do? I can get you on a schedule. Just that little thing. And we watch sales numbers increase by 150 to 200%. And yet many of them don't feel comfortable 
doing the estimate in the house because they want to go home and, and use the, you know more time and be perfect. And they don't feel comfortable asking for the sale because that's that's scary, apparently. It's been a long time done 20,000 estimates. I don't remember it being scary way back when, but anyway, it's it's it can be a scary thing. And so that's just one example of a dozen different things, like just these little nuanced things in our business model will lead to greater success. But then uh, there's just this hesitancy to really push into certain things. And uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I was at the, uh, the International Franchise Association uh, this past month. And uh, for anyone that's not aware, the, the IFA is the largest uh, association in franchising. There's a, a great amount of knowledge that is exchanged at, at the events and specifically the, the, the big one, the annual conference. And, and so I'm there and I'm listening in on a, on a, a, you know, a breakout session. And one of the uh, folks that's leading the conversation was, uh, you know, founder, CEO, very successful franchise organization. And, and uh, you know, I'm talking like maybe north of 400, 500 locations. And he's you know, saying that something that they talk about inside their home office, their team, is that, hey, look, we're going to bring them along kicking and screaming. And so they'll, they'll kind of, you know, hit each other in the hallways. They're like kicking and screaming, kicking and screaming. And, you know, it's ultimately for the organization's good to, you know, ask for the business in person, right? It, clearly, you are going to have in this business model, it's not true for every business model, but for your business, uh, obviously, footprint, it's important to ask in the presentation. And, uh, you know, still, you have a large percentage, maybe not the majority, but a big enough to be a, a, a notation right? Uh, not asking. And so bringing them along, kicking and screaming, right? Even against what's going to make them successful, what's going to benefit them. And, and, and you spoke to it, right? Being an experienced coach, you know, you said, hey, some are, are perfectionists and they want to go back home and do it in the setting where they can make it perfect. Somebody that's less detailed and, and more comfortable with kind of doing it on the fly they're going to have no problem asking. It's like, oh yeah, sure. Of course. Like, yeah, that it's, it's going to get me the business yet. The perfectionist is like, wait, hold on. We got to, you know, we got to make sure that this thing is buttoned up and perfect. Right. So it, it's interesting how, you know, you, you not only have to talk to somebody for who they are, what their skills are, but then how do you get them to do it? And, and, because that's totally different. How do they understand it? How do they learn it? And then how do they do it? Mm -hmm. And within a franchise company, you, know, you throw in the, the uh, independent business owner component. Nobody is W-2. Mm -hmm. right? All you can do it's, is, you know, you lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. That's a lot of our business reviews is just showing them mathematically. Like watch what happens if I increase your sales rate I have this huge long spreadsheet that's got lots of moving parts and it's pretty slick, but the, the bottom of the spreadsheet shows their potential income. Uh, and it's like, watch if I increase your sales numbers just by like 20%. If you start doing the estimates in the house and asking 20%, that's lower than what we typically see. And your income doubles. Now you're, you're not making 90, you're making 180. Like, do you think you should do your estimates in your house? And they, some are like, oh yeah. And then some are like, well, I don't know. Like, $90,000. Maybe you should start doing it. Uh, but all we can do is show them and they see their peers and they see, you know, the high flyers that are making tons of money and winning the awards and all that stuff. And, you know, they notice that those guys are the in the house ones and doing, you know, and that's just one example. There's other things that we do that. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I think that you understand what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. I don't like the kicking and screaming because it makes them sound like children, but um, sometimes you're like, oh, come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and sometimes it can seem so childish that somebody is going that much against what's going to make them successful. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and ultimately that's the franchise or franchisee relationship. Granted. Yeah. We're not, you know, no way is that about treating somebody like a child, but it is absolutely about getting somebody to do something that they may not see for their benefit right and and uh my goodness that is such a benefit in the franchise model 
that you know you have a leadership team that you trust in, that you believe in, and you know they have your back and you partnered with them because of their leadership style. There's all these options out there in the market and you get to choose which organization you're going to partner with. And a big part of that is culture. And, and in moments like this, how do I expect my franchisor to deal with me or others and situations? And because, uh, you know, not everything is going to be concern free, right? We're, we're, we're going to have moments of growth and moments of leveling up and, and, and growth and leveling up. It, it, it means stepping into your, your areas of discomfort and um, making decisions in the unknown and, and the beautiful thing about the franchise model is you get to do that with other individuals, other business owners, your home office. Um, and so on that note, Brian. Well, I was going to say, know, well, maybe I'll answer your question with, my, yeah, continue. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Go. Oh, no, absolutely. I was going to change the subject. So please. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we, we often use this analogy of this kind of path. We're walking down a path. And I really stole it from Pilgrim's Progress, if you ever read that that book but it's a it's an allegory right and we're on this path and and what i think franchising really is is these newbie franchisees that are just starting at the beginning of the path and starting to walk we're all on the exact same path some just happen to be farther along than others uh like hey i'm just three years down the road but even me i'm 15 years down the road and i'm on the exact same path like i i started in my garage i installed floors myself i sold i've done every single aspect of the job i've hired staff and i and i'm only asking people to do the exact same walk the exact same walk i've been walking for 15 years and i think there's so much peace that can come from that for a new franchisee to see 80 people in front of them walking the same path saying the same thing like hey just stay stay on the road it works you know, this is the path to, to, you know, a good, good income and a good lifestyle. And, uh, and I, yeah, so I, I think at the core of it, that's what franchising is. It's, it's setting a path. And, and so then we have this running joke of everybody wants to like create their own path. I'm going to go off here into this forest for some reason, like, no, 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 stay back on the road. And we have all of our staff, like walking along the side of the road, just pushing them back up on the, on the model, like, no, follow, follow the signs. You don't don't get off into the forest in the field somewhere. The farther you get off the path, the harder it is for us to get back. You get you back on. So, stay over here. Yeah, we 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 know we know countertops and kitchens is kind of like a floor. It's kind of like putting down a surface, but we it's not. We don't do that. And, oh. You know, just being silly and extreme there, right? I mean, oh, it, no, you never I mean, know. Before, we had somebody start getting into fencing. Like it's wood fence. I'm like, no, we don't do fencing. We do floors and fencing. That's no, no. Like stick, stick to the inside of the house, please. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My point. Right. And, and that's what strengthens the model creates brand consistency, right? The strength of the brand is that, okay, when I work with somebody uh, from, from footprints floors in Denver or Boise, Idaho, or New Jersey down to Florida, it's going to be a very, very similar experience from the culture, the values, uh, the, the service offered, and the way in which business is done, that consistency, the stronger that every franchise partner is committed to the same model and improving the same model. Yes, we want to innovate. Yes, we want to level up. But we want to do it with the same vision, the same implementation. Um, because really we're uniting all of our resources as a franchise organization. If we're kind of, you know, footprint floors of John, you know, in Spokane, and we do things differently, you know, it's really breaking the model and, and deteriorating what makes the brand great. And so that consistency, that alignment, everybody marching in the same path, it's such an important part of franchising. And so to that point, Brian, I'm just curious, you know, how do you work with your franchise partners when you are implementing something new, you're thinking about it, or you're just shifting the direction of the brand? You know, how, what does this collaborative process with franchise owners look like uh, for your organization? Um, cl clearly, you know, every franchise owner is in business for themselves, but they're not by themselves. Everyone's invested in this asset together. It's everybody's business. Granted, every franchise owner is licensing the brand and the systems and the blueprint. And that's the franchisor's responsibility to steward 
the quality of the brand. And yet you have all these investors that are franchise partners, that are owners, that are executing. It's an interesting dynamic there, but you know, for your organization, how do you guys uh, collaborate with the owners in implementing and, and ultimately changing or evolving the brand over time? Uh, I think it starts with just your perception and treatment of, of franchise partners. I, I've never, I've never seen them as uh, my employees. They're, they are truly my partners. And, and I really see the franchise or as, as the servant, like these are our customers in some way. Um, and, and it is tricky, right? Because we are responsible for the brand. So there's, there's, Hey, we, you got to do certain things, but we also, I just don't want to create a police state. So I want to create a, a very open environment with our franchisees where they feel safe and heard uh, that they can bring up new ideas. Uh, I love new ideas. I, I am the innovator of our business and I, I love it. That's just how I'm built. That's the whole goal setting thing. And um, so I love hearing new ideas and I don't have any problem telling people when they have a bad idea or if they have a great idea, let's do it. Um, and so we, we're constantly pushing that way. But I think it starts with the treatment of the franchisee and creating a culture of kind of an open forum of, of being able to talk and communicate access to the decision makers. Part of that's that business review. And a huge thing we've done almost since day one is we created, um, it's just, it's a forum, a Google chat. And so we have 140 people, a lot of employees, industry experts that are all in this chat. And there's 200 something comments every day. Um, we have different chats happening. Some are like flooring specific, so it might be more technical. And then we have one that's just the franchisees on a, on a chat. And there's a hundred and something on that one. Uh, and it's just all day asking questions. I'll pose questions. I'm on there. I probably answer more, more on there than anybody. Um, mm -hmm. So it might be systems, like, how do we do this? How do we implement that? It might be them saying, hey, I ran into these guys in my market. Has anybody ever heard of this company? We should partner with them. And there's just this constant flow of information. So we're really tapping into 175 markets of ideas instead of everything having to generate from one central point. And I love it. 100, 175 different places all talking. We have over a thousand people in this business now. And so all of these different minds and skill sets and backgrounds are so diverse, school teachers, and, you know, we have a cosmetic industry, like manufacturer, manager, like everything in between you can name. And I love the diverse backgrounds that we do have and the diverse thoughts. And so we really tap into it. Uh, we do annual uh, convention, which has been huge and bringing together people and ideas and seeing each other face to face. I, I love doing that. There's something else big that we do that, uh, oh, we just launched about four months ago, a, uh, an advisory council made up of franchisees voted on by their peers. Uh, so we had our first meeting a couple of weeks ago and we're starting to push into that. And that's really a platform or a place for, for ideas to flow up from the franchisees to the franchisor and then vice versa. And really just kind of a, a talking ground, a place to sort out what we should be doing and not doing. And because I want their feedback. I don't want to do anything that's going to be detrimental to the overall system. That's that's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. I want to make lives easier, not harder. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was watching, uh, you know, I never really watched the History Channel, not that I have anything against it, but I was kind of just, you know, scanning through the channel yesterday and killing some time. I, I stumbled on this show is like, uh, you know, the restaurant that, that founded America, something like that. And I thought, oh, this seems pretty interesting. And sure enough, it was. It, it really was hitting on Dairy Queen and mm -hmm. how Dairy Queen innovated soft serve ice cream. And up until then, it was really just, you know, kind of just frozen ice cream. And, and at the time, they didn't have machines to create the soft serve. And in fact, they really struggled with just mass freezers and ice cream just in general like the industry was not where it is today for sure but Dairy Queen being the innovative company that they were you know created all of that and as they started scaling through franchising their owners were you know they really wanted to start buttoning down on consistency across the brand they had this national footprint that was laid but their issue that they came up on their plateau was that they uh, had inconsistencies across all of their locations. So folks would go to a Dairy Queen here and a Dairy Queen there, and it was just like, whatever, right? It, whatever menu and maybe a twist on the logo. And uh, and, and so 
um, when they standardized everything, they actually standardized food mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, incorporated the hamburger and fries. And like, that is nothing like ice cream, like a hamburger and fries, right? So like now they're not only mass on a franchise, from a franchise perspective nationally, you know, serving ice cream, they're also in the fast food business now. And, you know, that was, that was just such a, a neat, I could just totally relate running a franchise organization, much like yourself, Ryan, where, you know, you have the consistencies of the brand and what makes it powerful, but yet there is innovation and collaboration from the franchise owners. They have a good beat on what's going on day in, day out. What's making them competitive? What are some, some new entities in the market that everyone should incorporate including into the business so that it makes it easy for everybody so you guys have created a franchise advisory council and, and so you know that yeah this really standardizes the way that franchise owners influence the what's being implemented in the brand the direction of the brand um yeah what a what an exciting uh, development within your organization. We actually just implemented our FAC about half a year ago. So we're about the same time frame, And, awesome. you know, it's really been, uh, you know, picking up steam and, and we've really been standardizing the cadences for communication. And there are some growing pains in it and understanding, okay, what are the dynamics of decision-making and what are the dynamics of the franchise owners and how they contribute in the home office and how they contribute and, you know, at the core of all that is trust and communication and, and ultimately the customer. And it's something I've really been settling on as of late is that the home office and the franchise owners are united, engaged, accountable, and, you know, working together for the customer. And so I think it really just does a beautiful job of simplifying what are we doing here at the FAC, like this is about being competitive in the marketplace and taking our business and the way that we operate in the marketplace, because that's what we're doing. We're competing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a competitive landscape. Yeah, exactly. How do, how do we differentiate ourselves from the other flooring companies, the other paint companies or whatever your, your industry is. And yeah, that's exactly what we do. And you know, we install floors. I've been saying for 15 years, like we don't do anything, do anything magical. We install floors. And so customers would ask, well, why should I go with you? And it's, yeah, it's because you you get me. It's it's this concept of integrity. We're, we're going to show up. Not all flooring installers are created equal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're pushing against that misconception or that myth. that's like, oh, this floor guy or that floor guy or this painter or that painter, they're all the same, right? Oh, absolutely not. This is not a car getting made with lasers in a factory somewhere. This is humans molding nature in your home and you're hoping for the best. So the Air Force Academy slogan, I don't know if you saw it when you were there for that wrestling tournament last week, but uh, it's uh, integrity first, service before self and excellence in all we do. Uh, and that's really been ingrained into me just in how I conduct myself and really what we pass along to our franchisees. It's integrity first which means doing the right thing, even when no one's watching. It's service before self. It's really putting the needs of your customers, the needs of your crews before yourselves. And that's just excellence in all we do. You know, work as though you're working for the Lord alone. Um, and if you start with all of that, then everything else takes care of itself. You're so right, Brian. In in integrity, service, excellence. I mean, those three things done consistently for any organization, you're going to kick your competitor's butt all day. And the, the competitors that can do that with you, great, they're going to make you better. Those are, the, those are the peers in the competitive landscape that are actually going to make you better. You're going to make each other better. But it, it's really hard to consistently deliver integrity, set service, and excellence. And, and so the organizations that are able to rise and do that across the, the country in this example, those are the ones that are going to, you know, the cream rises to the top. and. And uh, that is a beautiful journey that a franchise organization is aligned in doing that, doing it with integrity, serving one another in, commit, in a commitment to excellence to deliver, you know, a flooring service, a painting service, um, and, and, and do it under that brand. It's really a, a, a fun, it's really a fun process. And, uh, you know, I, I, I commend you again for all the things that you're doing. I love the FAC. You know, what are some, 
some KPIs, right? Let's change the subject a little bit, get us some KPIs. What are some, some key performance indicators in your business that you guys are really aligned behind and, and you know are going to uh, move the dial for the business? Overall franchise business or each individual franchisee? Uh, let's go individual franchise owner. Profitability is our, our number one. And then just joy, enjoying what they do. That's And that's a hard metric, right? You just simply ask. But you you have enough conversations with your franchisees. You figure out if they're liking life or not. And mm -hmm. uh, while we would love both to be doing awesome, making tons of money and enjoying it, uh, that's that's the goal. And, and for the most part, that's what we see. And are there hard days? Yeah. But we come alongside, mentor and you know, our, our director of uh, franchise support, who's answers to me, he's kind of the guy in charge of the development of all these franchisees nationally is a, as a pastor, as a previous pastor, it's what he did in his previous life. He was Air Force pastor, and now he's a, fr a franchise. So, so he really has this heart for people and just hearing them and listening to where they're at and, and help because it's, it's a spiritual battle running a business as much as anything. So uh, while well, there's not a, a, a metric there, it's it's constant interaction with our franchisees to make sure they're doing well emotionally and spiritually. Uh, but then also uh, bottom line revenue, there's this false thinking of top line revenue, which is generally what franchisors care about, right? Because our royalties are attached to the, the top line. And we've done everything we can to avoid that line of thinking. We care about the profitability of the franchisee. If he's making good money, then, then we're fine. And we shouldn't you know, franchisee, we do have some that have really high top line, you know, gross revenues, but then are, are making good money. And those are the guys we really need to come alongside and help remedy that issue. Is it a gross margin issue? Are they undercharging their customer or overpaying their crews or materials or whatever it is? Uh, yeah, I would say those are our two main uh, KPIs. And, and in looking at, we do reviews and surveys with homeowners, and then we're watching five-star reviews on the internet, overall reputation in a given market. Those are really important, although our guys knock it out of the park. So it's not really a, a huge concern. We have tons and tons of five stars out there. So, uh, but yeah, just something to, to be monitoring for sure. Yeah, getting getting great five-star reviews is key, right? Gr growing that local brand halo. Uh, you know, everyone goes online to get confidence in, in doing business with anybody, whether it's food, a service you're going to get, an, an auto place or you're going to check out a vehicle, uh, business is done online. Those reviews are, are pivotal. Uh, one thing that we've learned, which is an interesting little nugget here, uh, is that when you get the review on the job site before the job is closed out, like your ability to get reviews goes through the roof. As soon as you leave and you follow up with communications trying to get the review, it doesn't matter how happy they were. They, they're five star thumbs up all day long, but it's Soon as they close Life out happens. the account, they forget. Yeah, and this is one of those uh, things that we push. We we tell them at the end of a job, just make it awkward. Say, hey, do you feel like we did five star service at your house? And every single, you know, not pretty much everybody's like, oh yeah, your guys were great. Okay, would you mind giving me a five star now? I'll send you the link. <laughs> and then you just look at them, and they're like, oh crap, I thought I was going to be able to, you know, procrastinate and then not do this. But you just make it awkward, and they do it. And that's just an, an example of. We're asking franchisees, push into this awkward and do it because you're going to get a lot of five-star reviews if you do it. And there's just pushback out of fear. And I don't want to do that. That's weird. And like, that's how you, that's how you get reviews. You just, you make it awkward and mm -hmm. people do it. <laughs> yep. I love it. Right. You know, just, hey, you know, whether it's uh, asking for the sale, asking for the review, just make it awkward just for your, awkward. for your best performance. Yep. And, and it's only, it's, it's internal fear. It's never, the customers are always fine. They're like, oh yeah, like I've been on that side. How many times have we been asked for reviews as we're going about as consumers, right? You're at the car dealership or the everywhere. We get constantly asked and I don't care. Like, sure, I'll give it to you. It's not weird for me as the consumer. And, and I think our homeowners are the same way. It's, yeah. it's fear in the franchisee, not fear in the, the homeowner. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. And um, again, what a powerful, you know, uh, resource to lean on as a franchise owner. You, you're you're not alone. You're in business with your peers. Who your peers are also telling you get the review, ask for the sale, 
right? Your coaches, your home office are doing the same thing. Um, Brian, you shared so many nuggets here, uh, so much gold that uh, you, you just humbly deliver. Um, I can see why, you know, if I'm a potential franchise owner, why I'm wanting to team up with your organization. You just do, you do business the right way. And uh, it's clear that your franchise owners are front and center and, and you're serving them uh, with excellence and integrity. Brian, I, I can talk to you for so long. Uh, obviously that's not possible today, but we definitely need to get together. Most certainly uh, we're here in each other's backyards. So you'll be hearing from me. Uh, I'll be uh, bugging you trying to, maybe, maybe we can get together for a game uh, over at Ball Arena or something. But um, if anyone is interested in getting in touch with you, uh, learning more, how can they do that? If you want to learn more about the franchising, it's it's footprintsfloors.com. We have a little button in the top. I think it's footprintsfranchising.com. I should probably know that, right? But yeah, if you'd like to learn more, we have tons of information, tons of marketing material out there, webinars and podcasts and you name it. It's it's out there. We're, yeah, there's no shortage. So mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Nick. This has been awesome. Yep. And uh, Footprints Floors, uh, please check them out online. Like you, like Brian said, you can find them anywhere online. They have some tremendous content. And uh, please uh, like this video, but more importantly, subscribe to the show. It's how we're able to continue to grow and get amazing guests like Brian on the show. Uh, but also uh, contribute to the convo here. Drop some comments. Let us know your thoughts. Clearly, uh, I leveled up. I'm sure you did as well. And Brian, thanks again for being on the show. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Nick. As always, level up. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. Remember, it's never too late to get started on your entrepreneurial journey. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed today's segment. Catch us again next week and visit LimePainting.com for more of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show.